The first item of business this morning is consideration of PE 1458 by Peter Cherby on the Register of Interest for Members of Scotland's Judiciary. The committee will be taking evidence today from the Right Honourable Lord Gill, the former Lord President of the Court of Session. I welcome Lord Gill to the meeting. He is accompanied today by Roddy Flynn, the Legal Secretary to the Lord President. I invite Lord Gill to make a brief opening statement, after which we will move to questions. Over to you, Lord Gill. Thank you, Mr Convener, for your welcome. Uh, your predecessor wrote to me uh, in June of this year and uh, invited me to discuss with the committee my views on what the petition seeks. Um, I'm very happy to do that today. Um, it does seem to me that the petition raises some quite straightforward questions as to the purpose of the proposal and as to the problems that um, it, it seeks to deal with, if they exist. But, of course, behind it, in my view, there are wider constitutional issues regarding the position of the judiciary in Scotland. And also there is a question, really, to be asked, and that is, what is this committee's opinion of the judiciary that we have got. Uh, I don't want to take up time, Mr Convener. Um, I want to leave as much time as possible for the committee's questions. For the moment, I shall simply say that I'm not entirely certain what is to go into the proposed register. I I'm not clear what current problems there are that the register would solve, uh, and therefore I'm sceptical about what it would achieve. But I would hope that perhaps there would be time for us to uh, take a wider view of this and consider the, that perhaps the constitutional questions are such that this petition may not be the appropriate way uh, of dealing with them. seems to me there's a very serious question as to why Scotland should wish to be out of step with every other jurisdiction in the United Kingdom. Um, and with New Zealand, which is the example the petition mentions, uh, in this respect. So with that, Mr Convener, I'm happy to discuss whatever matters the committee wish to raise. Well, thank you very much for uh, introducing your thoughts to the, the consideration that the committee will have. I'll, I'm happy to pass over to members of the committee, because my throat might not last very long this morning. I don't want to use it up too much. But if there are any members of the committee who have got questions that they want to ask immediately, I'll pass over. John. Thank you very much. Good morning, Lord Gill and Mr Flynn. Just for the record, could I ask uh, in what capacity is Mr Flynn here today uh, in the witness chair? Uh, because clearly he works for the Lord President's office. You are the former Lord President, Lord Gill. Uh, so I just want clout and given the position when you were the Lord President, you refused to come before this committee to give evidence. You met with the previous uh, convener and vice convener uh, privately uh, to discuss the petition. So could I just seek clarification through you, convener? What is Mr Flynn's capacity at this meeting this morning? I can answer that very, very simply. Uh, when I was Lord President, uh, Mr Flynn was my legal secretary and uh, he was closely involved in this aspect of uh, the work of my office. Um, he's here today simply because he's uh, familiar with the documentation and um, uh, in case I need to refer to any documents, um, he, he'll help me to do so. Um, I think you said he was a witness, but he's not. Well, that, that's a matter of record convener in terms of what we have in terms of the, the paperwork uh, presented to the committee this morning because we, what actually says in the agenda is we'll take evidence from the Right Honourable Lord Gill, former Lord President of the Court of Session, and Roddy Flynn, Legal Secretary to Lord President. So if we just, I wanted to get that clarified, convener, because I wanted to be clear about whether or not, and I assume that's why uh, Lord Gill, uh, Mr Flynn, was here this morning uh, as, the, as your Legal Secretary when you were the Lord President 
Uh, but I just wanted to get that on the record, Convener. To move to the petition... Uh, That's wrong, Mr Wilson. Uh, well, but, I'm yeah, yeah. To, Lord Gilpa, I have presented in front of me yeah. is what I'm reading from, and the agenda actually stipulates take evidence from. Now, I'm sure in, the, in your work, in your line of work... I think I've got it. One of the questions that's asked, if Lord Gill wanted to defer to Mr Flynn to answer the question, or if a member of the committee wanted to ask Mr Flynn a question directly, that would be perfectly in order, in which case Mr Flynn would then be a witness. I don't think it's any more complicated yep. than yep. that, John. Yep. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get it on the record, Convener, because we did have a problem uh, previously when this committee tried to get evidence, uh, and they'll go on to that issue later on. But to get to the heart of the matter we're discussing this morning is the petition that has been lodged uh, by Peter Cherby. Now, in relation to your views, Lord Gill, you don't think that a register would be... Is it appropriate or necessary? I don't think that it is either of those things. Right. That, it's just that we have, and Peter Cherby has provided the committee previously with uh, various pieces of evidence uh, to the committee to justify <laughs> his position. Uh, and since the petition was originally introduced, we have the register of recusal has been introduced, so we know that when uh, judges or sheriffs recuse themselves from particular cases because they have a particular interest. We had one situation where a judge, I believe it, recused themselves because they were a member of the RSPB uh, and felt they couldn't hear a case uh, because of the, the conflict in that type of membership. Part of the difficulty is the recusal, the register of recusal, is a voluntary register, as I understand. So it's up to judges and sheriffs themselves to decide, to declare, uh, to recuse themselves from hearing a case before them. Surely, if we did have a register, as highlighted by the petition, then the issue of recusal would become less likely because people would then be publicly aware of the interests of the person sitting on the bench uh, in judgment of a case. Well, two points in answer to that. One is that the, the register is not voluntary. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the uh, clerks of court uh, are scrupulously accurate in keeping it, and therefore, wherever there is a recusal, you may depend upon it. It, it will be recorded in the register. But perhaps the more important point is that uh, there are countless cases where... Um, the, the register doesn't even come into play because you may find in a sheriff court, particularly in the country areas, that the sheriff will say to the sheriff clerk, if any cases come into this court involving such and such a body or such and such a person, make sure I don't get them because uh, I, I've, I've got a connection there. With the result that, of course, the cases never reach the sheriff and therefore the register um, it never comes into play. And that's always been the case. And, and after a while in a court, most uh, sheriff clerks will know exactly the sort of cases in which the local sheriff may have some sort of connection. Um, I don't really see it as a problem. The other thing, of course, is that I should, forgive me if I just add this point too that what's become very clear from the register of recusals is that the vast majority are related to circumstances that this petition, this register that's being proposed, uh, we would not affect in any way. For example, supposing the sheriff and the night before a case sees the defender's witness list and he recognises someone who's a close friend, then, of course, um, he'll immediately recuse himself. But a register of assets such as this petition proposes would, would be of no value in a situation like that. Your opinion? The, just in terms of the... We've had, heard from the 
two judicial complaints reviewers, uh, the current judicial complaints reviewer and the previous judicial complaints reviewer, who both have indicated that they would welcome uh, a register of interests uh, and, and the current judicial complaints reviewer actually indicated that they would like to see that register also include the hospitality uh, given or received. Uh, do you think the judicial complaints reviewers are wrong in their opinion in relation to the keeping a register uh, as well as including the hospitality uh, given or received? Because we have a recent uh, press article uh, highlighted a situation with sheriffs uh, who were involved in overseas trips. Uh, and one sheriff in particular has called for uh, his peers to be removed from the committee, all of them, because he's accused them of leaking information about sheriff's trips, overseas trips. Surely if we had a register where those things were being declared and publicly declared, then there'd be less need uh, for accusations to be made uh, against sheriffs or judges uh, in relation to their activities either within the UK, Scotland or elsewhere in the world? Well, the first uh, judicial complaint reviewer uh, was based strongly of the opinion that there should be a, a register of assets for judicial office holders and as you will obviously infer, uh, I, I disagreed entirely with her about that. As for the current um, complaints reviewer, uh, I think she came here probably to speak about something rather different and she was asked about it and she expressed her views. Um, all I can say to you is I don't agree with them. But in your question, uh, I think perhaps you've rather changed the, the agenda of this meeting because my understanding is that what we're here to discuss is a proposal in this petition that there should be a register of uh, judicial office holders, assets and property. Um, if, you're now dis if you're now suggesting that you want a register of gifts and hospitality, then that's a separate issue that would have to be dealt with separately. Convener, I was referring to the current Judicial Complaints Reviewer's comments and the Judicial Complaints Reviewer came to this committee to discuss the petition that is before us this morning. Uh, and in response to questions asked to the Judicial Complaints Reviewer, they did indicate that they felt there should be a register of interest and they extended that, the current Judicial Complaints Reviewer extended that to include hospitality, uh, either given or received. So in relation to the issue, yes, it does widen out the scope of the original petition, but it was something that was raised when uh, evidence was given to this committee by the Judicial Complaints Review. I, I have read her evidence. Thank you, Convener. David. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Can you tell me or expand why you think the current safeguards in place are su sufficient? Well, it's very obvious that for a long time in, in Scotland, the judiciary have operated on a basis of integrity deriving from the judicial oath that they take upon appointment and the terms of that are quite stark quite plain and they are the lamp by which every judge is guided in his judicial path in addition to that in the modern era we have added to it the code of judicial ethics which is a very carefully crafted document that went through a very wide process of consultation and drafting. And that really gives every judicial office holder where it needed um, clear guidance on all the sort of problems of um, ethics that uh, are likely to occur. 
So the question is, is this committee in a position where it trusts the judges of this country to do what they do with integrity and honour? Or does it feel that there are among the judicial office holders of Scotland men and women who are liable to act wrongfully? That, of course, depends on how you approach the problem. It may be that if your starting point is that you have a belief that among the judges and sheriffs there are men and women who are capable of hearing cases in which they have a personal interest and therefore are capable of being guilty of misconduct contrary to their oath, then, of course, I can see that there, there is an argument for having a register. As you will imagine, now, Mr Torrance, I take the opposite view. After 50, nearly 50 years um, in the legal profession, uh, I believe more strongly than ever that the Scottish judiciary are dedicated and committed, that they are honourable and loyal to their judicial oath, and that they have integrity. If I had thought that among the judicial office holders in Scotland there were men and women who did not have that standard of honour, I would not have wished to be their leader. John, you want to us a supplementary? Just a supplementary to that question. The, in your term of office as the Lord President, Lord Gill, how many judges or sheriffs were suspended or removed for, from the bench for inappropriate behaviour? None that I know of. Acting Sheriff Watson? He, he, Sheriff Watson was a, a temporary sheriff. The, the and he sheriff. was... Just a moment. May I finish? He, he was not, as you put it, removed from office. What happened was that a litigation arose in, in which he was involved and I, in the exercise of my discretion, suspended him from sitting as a temporary sheriff until the matter was resolved. I'll go back to my original question, convener. How many sheriffs or judges were suspended or removed from the bench during your term of office as Lord President? Well, I, as I've told you, the answer is I suspended uh, temporary sheriff uh, Watson. I did not suspend any other judicial office holder, nor was it in my power to remove them from office. They can only be removed from office by a procedure uh, which involves uh, the First Minister and involves this Parliament. Thank you. Okay, just to, to come in on the back of that question then, would a register, had the, the temporary sheriff registered an interest, would that have helped or had any no. implications at all in terms of your decision? No, you've, you, you've made my point, Mr Convener, that that would not have been caught in a register. And by the way, we can't make any uh, judgments of fact about <coughs> that case because it's still, as I understand it, a matter of litigation. We don't know what the facts are. OK, Angus. OK, <coughs> uh, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, Lord Gill. Uh, good morning, Mr Flynn. <coughs> Um, as we've heard, uh, one of your main arguments is uh, that judges have a different role from other uh, public officials. Um, could you perhaps explain in more detail in, in what way the role of a judge is different from, from that of uh, other public officials and why this merits the judiciary uh, being treated differently as regards uh, a register of financial interests? Yes, if, if you are let's say, a councillor in a local authority, and you are engaged in the, the business of the authority, you will be involved in making decisions that involve the spending of council money, the placing of contracts, the purchasing of services, and so on. 
And it, it is perfectly understandable that in public life, uh, people should be able to know that when an individual councillor is voting on whether a particular company should be given a particular contract, entirely understandable that that it should be publicly known what, if any, interest the uh, that councillor should have. Judges fulfil an entirely different function. They administer the law. They resolve disputes between parties. They by their imaginative development of the law, they improve the law, they extend it, they, they explain it in, in their judgments. That is an entirely different constitutional function. Now, if I could put it to you this way, in a devolved Scotland, the ministers the legislators, like you, and the judges, as I once was, carry out their quite different functions in their own different ways. But that is dependent upon their doing so in a spirit of mutual confidence in which these three organs of the state carry out their functions in the knowledge that they have the trust of the others and that is why in Scotland today our devolved democracy is working so well the assumption underlying this petition of course it, it raises a matter of extreme concern the petition implies that there are judicial office holders in this country who are unfit to hold that office. If the committee accedes to the principles behind this petition, then I think it would be very regrettable because it would mean that this committee had evinced its own belief that there are judges and sheriffs in this country uh, who are not to be trusted. Today, I would like to invite you as a committee to demonstrate your confidence in this country's judiciary. And if you were to do that, then I'm convinced that both you as legislators and the, the judiciary would be all the better for that. OK, so, uh, thank you, Lord Gill, for that response. I think it was important to get that uh, fundamental view uh, on, on, on the record. Um, if I could move to uh, looking at other jurisdictions, um, what's your view on the fact that uh, uh, the USA has successfully introduced uh, a register of judicial interests, and do you think that the, you, the system in the States has increased public confidence in the judi judiciary? I don't know if you would want to have a judiciary here like they have in the United <laughs> States. It's an entirely a matter for your own personal point of view. Okay, well... well <laughs> I'm, I'm not giving um, you my view, but you can guess what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't pick up on that uh, particular point, but ha has there been a any evidence on the, the impact that the US system has had on a uh, judge's independence uh, or the way that the media, for example, treats judges in the USA? Well, I, I would be very sorry to see a judiciary in which candidates uh, ran for election. I'd be very sorry to see a judiciary in which candidates' election campaigns <coughs> were based upon fundraising from uh, companies and corporations who would be litigants in their courts. And I'd be very sorry if the day ever came where, before appointment, judges had to come before um, a committee of this honourable legislature uh, uh, for confirmation and for examination of their political, ethical and social views. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jackson. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Lord Gill. Oh, Carlo, good Can morning, I say uh, how delighted I am that you're with us this morning. Um, when this petition first came before us in 2012, I have to say I, I thought it rather vexatious. 
Um, but we went through the normal process that we do and initiated the inquiries as is our want. Um, and what surprised me, given that you had a record of giving evidence to other committees of this parliament, and given that there's nothing terribly controversial in the evidence that you have given us this morning in response to the actual petition, was why you felt it was inappropriate to comment to the committee at that much earlier stage before this petition started to gain attention and momentum in the media and to meet but only privately with the convener and deputy convener as was of the committee and presumably to say to them what you've said to us today, um, all of which unfortunately gave wind to those who felt that there was something slightly paternalistic in the approach that was being suggested, which was one of, well, I'm not terribly interested in discussing this. Um, I have told you that I think it largely a bunch of nonsense. Um, please accept that to be so and um, carry on, if I can put it like that. So I'm interested, in what was the reluctance and what do you feel could only be said in private that, that you feel able to say today? Well, I, I don't know if it was you, Mr. Carlo. I think it may have been who... I probably added a bit of colour. You, you so. <laughs> said that, that I looked down upon the hoi polloi and... Um, I freely admit to a I bit of colour in order to compensate for the, for the, the magisterial response we had received, Lord yeah. Gill. Well, I think, I think your remark might have come as a surprise to people who know me. <laughs> but, um, you know, th this, this is all water under the bridge. We can't keep harping on about this forever. The main thing today is to, to discuss this petition, which is what I'm here to, to do. But anyway, um, you've asked the question, and I've got a jolly good answer for you, so here it comes. The point was that in two detailed letters I set out my reasons why I was against this petition. I hope and I think that I set those reasons out with the greatest of clarity. I had no further reasons to add to that and therefore I was quite satisfied that I had placed before this committee all the help that I could give it. Now I've appeared on numerous occasions before uh, the Justice Committee in this very room. So it's not as though I have an aversion to appearing before committees. And I'm, I have to say, I'm very happy to be here today uh, and I'm enjoying this stimulating <laughs> conversation. But having given you all that I could do, there was nothing to be gained by my coming here. And I had also to consider the office of Lord President, which I then held. And my judgment was that it was not a situation where under the Scotland Act it was necessary that I should come here uh, for examination before the committee. That was the view I took. I'm aware that you take a different view and I hope that in differing on that we won't fall out. Oh, I'm, I'm sure we won't. Uh, well, thank you for that. And, uh, uh, but, but obviously you then did meet privately with the convener and the deputy yes, convener to explore the very issues of the advice that you felt you had given us. And I only suggest that in so doing, um, it created beyond this committee an impression that there was a reluctance uh, to... Uh, bear witness to the advice that had been given no, or, that, to, or to allow us to explore with you the contrary advice that we had received, which again this morning you've dismissed from the, um, the former uh, chair of the JCR. No, I think that is a highly over-dramatised view of what I did. It seemed to me that uh, since there was concern among the committee, it was perfectly reasonable for me to meet the then convener, uh, discuss what his concerns were. And what came out of that was really quite helpful because I was able to tell him things he didn't know. I told him, for example, that if he wanted to know 
what all my assets were, then he could go to the Scottish Courts website and get them, and he didn't know that. And I also told him that I was perfectly happy, if it would help, uh, to institute a recording system uh, for recusals. And he said he thought that would be a good idea. And I, I, I went back to my office and my, my staff uh, duly implemented that. Okay. I mean, have I, you got any questions I for me say about that the I merits remain, of this petition, I, Mr. I do Pat. actually remain broadly sympathetic to the views you expressed. Yes. I simply say to you that I think that yes. it was unfortunate that, uh, that we found ourselves in the position that we did. You spoke movingly, well, well, and I have to well, say... Mr. With Mr. Carlo, look, this is water under the bridge now. I'm well, that's why I'm to moving talk on. About this well, please ask me some questions about the petition, if, if you may, because I think that really that's what... It's the most profitable use of time. Well, I, I, I'll ask questions on the petition and also on the remarks you made in opening and in response to the answers that you gave. If you'll forgive me to allow me to frame my own questions oh, rather than have them suggested to me. No, please do. You spoke movingly and with conviction earlier about why you felt this uh, in, a petition was inappropriate and unnecessary. And I would suggest that probably representatives of each of the professions who have ever found themselves the subject of a register, their leaders would have said much the same about the character of the individuals with whom they themselves uh, kept company. That in itself was not an argument against the register. You said that it would put us out of step with the rest of the United Kingdom, which is something of a monkey see, monkey do argument. Uh, Scotland has led the way in a number of different aspects of legislation and the fact that other parts of the United Kingdom have chosen not to do something is not in itself an argument. And I simply ask you, despite the eloquent way in which you, you spoke about the character of the individuals involved, uncomfortably for us both perhaps, do we not live in a more cynical age in which transparency and the aims of the petition as set out have become part of commonplace life and that which many of the public now expect of us, irrespective of where we find ourselves serving. Well, it, you may be right. It, it may be that the public, it may even be that the legislature is in a more cynical frame of mind than in the past. Um, that may be just an aspect of the modern world, but I know of no example of a case where this register would have prevented it from occurring. And as far as I can see, any problems that are likely to arise in this area are exactly the sort of problems that this petition would not address. And what I've mentioned to you is the most common one. And that is the case where the judicial office holder either knows one of the parties or knows one of the witnesses. And um, a register's not going to pick that up. The petition also mentions the New Zealand uh, situation and, of course, uh, as the committee may know, the, uh, when the proposal was put to the New Zealand Parliament um, in February, uh, it was uh, defeated by 104 votes to 16. Um, if you don't have the documentation about that, I'd be happy to make it available. I read it up in preparation for this meeting. And in that case, it arose from a most unfortunate situation where a judge in a case actually owed money to one of the, the lawyers. Well, obviously it was deplorable that uh, such a judge would sit in that case, but I think you'll appreciate that that would not be caught by this register. So, so what, what, it, what no. it really comes to is this that this register does not meet what appear to be the concerns. And in, on the contrary, it is, it, there is just no evidence basis to, to support it. 
Okay. I'm, I'm finally convened. Thank you, Lord Gill. Because in essence, your argument, beyond all others, is that the actual objective as established in the petition by the petitioner would not actually necessarily satisfy the objective he potentially is trying to seek. That is my view. Yeah. Can I ask you then just finally, and given that you accepted that we may live in a more cynical age and than neither of us might wish that we did, um, is there in your mind something further yet which might arise in the foreseeable future, in the most general of terms, which might give further public confidence. And given the <coughs> illustrations you gave of the oath and the, 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 the process that currently exists, do you think that that in itself is a properly understood by the public uh, in terms of the confidence that they can take in the judiciary? Yes, I do. I, I feel very strongly that the people of this country have a judiciary whom they know and they trust. And it is one of the reasons why one would want to live in a country like this. It is important that the public should know that the Scottish judiciary enjoys a reputation throughout the judicial world that is out of all proportion to the size of our small nation. The influence that it exerts in judicial thinking is enormous. The Scottish judiciary is admired, it is respected, uh, and it plays its part in the international world of judicial affairs. We should be very proud of that. It's one of Scotland's best assets. And it, it would be such it would be such a tribute to our judiciary if this committee were actually to acknowledge that by its decision in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And Zala. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, good morning, Lord Gill. Um, I, I have to be honest with you that uh, I'm very impressed with what you've said to us this morning. Um, and I want to perhaps ask your opinion on something that no one's actually raised, and that is that if, and I, I, I use the word if guardedly, there was to be a register, would, do you think that that could actually put our judiciary at risk in terms of security and terrorism? I don't think so. I, 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 I don't see that as a serious problem. Uh, I, 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 as you'll have gathered from my previous answers. I simply think that it would just achieve nothing. It's just the, the reason why I ask is because I think this a register would introduce another layer of information which is perhaps greater than currently available, despite the fact that it might not have a practical role. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just thinking that would, would it be wise for us to have that out there in the open? I don't... I really don't think so. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lord Gill, just one question I'd like to ask you. <clears throat> Short of agreeing with this petition, um, which I know that you're encouraging us not to do, do you believe that an enhancement of the complaints system could address any concerns that people may have about the interest that a, a, a sheriff or, or judge would have sitting in a case? Well, you know, given the, the number of cases that go through the Scottish courts in a year, the volume of complaints that come to the Lord President is, is remarkably, remarkably small. And very, very few of these complaints are actually upheld. There is a very efficient system for investigating them. Um, it is carried out thoroughly and effectively. And I don't really think that, is, that is in, it is in any urgent need of improvement. It is working well. Because the role of the complaint reviewer, uh, we have to remember, is not 
to deal with the merits of these complaints, the role of the reviewer is to ensure that the complaints are handled correctly and that the process is carried out in accordance with the regulations. And that, that is a useful function and um, it, it is very helpful to have a reviewer. But on the merits of the complaints, I think, I think you, may be, you may be reassured by me that it is being handled very well. In normal circumstances, who would take a complaint? Would it be a defence lawyer? Would it be a, wit a, a, a witness? Well, very often the complainer is the losing party in a, in, in a litigation. Um, it's perfectly understandable. Um, there are very few, there are very few official complaints, if I can put it that way. They're, they are mostly from mem members of the public, and we have a very effective system of dealing with them. As soon as they come in, they are immediately assigned to the disciplinary judge, who then reads the papers. And if there is, if there is a reasonable basis for investigating them further then they're, they are then investigated by an independent investigator. For example, if it was a complaint against a, sh a sheriff, it would probably be carried out by a sheriff principal from another jurisdiction. Uh, and the matter has gone into very thoroughly, and then at the end of the day it comes before the Lord President with a recommendation which he is free to accept or, 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 or to modify. I suppose the follow-up question then is, if someone was to make a complaint, they must already have a suspicion that something is untoward with the, yeah. the, the sheriff who's presiding, I in which case, the, whether that information is on a register or not on a register would be irrelevant. Yeah, they, you'd be surprised how few, few of the complaints have any substance in them. And when they do have substance in them, in my experience, it tends to be as to the behaviour on the bench rather than as to any um, personal interest on the part of the judicial office holder. You know, sometimes judicial office holders do get, get exasperated on the bench. You'd be surprised. Uh, okay. the other colleagues of Angus. Uh, can we now <coughs> With regard to the um, Scottish Law Commission, um, I mean, clearly you would like us to take a decisive action on, on this petition. But in, in doing so, um, would it be your view that um, there, there would be some merit in the Scottish Law Commission examining this issue in more detail? That's not a matter for me. Um, the Scottish Law Commission will draw up its programme of work and uh, that will then be approved by the Justice Minister, and the Justice Minister may make individual references to the Commission on ad hoc topics. Um, it, it may be that uh, uh, the Justice Minister would wish to refer that to the Commission. That's a matter for him. But you don't have a view on it? I, well, for the, for, the, for the moment, until someone can come up with a, a specific example uh, of a case where this register would have made any difference, I will continue to take the view that it, it achieves no purpose. Okay. Thank you. John. Thank you, Convener. Once again, Lord Gill, the purpose of the petition that was before us and that was submitted, uh, and you made reference earlier to the, the petition only calls for a register of pecuniary interests, but the, when you read into the further into the petition, it actually talks about submit their interest and hospitality received to a publicly available register of interest. Now, we do have registers in place, and the registers have been instituted uh, under your uh, Lord Presidency in relation to the recusal, list of recusal, uh, public register there. And also, we do have, and the petitioner kindly furnished us for today's meeting with the the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service Judicial Members Shareholding Register, which has been introduced as well. So surely the petition has served some purpose uh, and has, action has been taken mm -hmm. to address some of those issues because you mentioned earlier that when you met with the convener and the deputy convener of this committee in private session, 
you refer to the register of recusals. Uh, so surely the, the debate that we've had around this petition has been useful and has moved not only the Parliament forward and the petitioner's issues forward, but also moved the Lord President's office forward. I disagree with you emphatically, Mr Wilson. Um, all that the register of recusals has done is to prove exactly the point that I made to your convener at the time, and that is that there has not been a single example of a recusal which would be in any way connected to this petition. So it has, it has, it has been useful evidence from my point of view in demonstrating that uh, uh, what I had imagined was the case is the case. And the second point is that as far as the register of interests of members of Scottish courts are concer concerned, that register was in existence long before this petition was lodged. So this petition has not been the cause of that. Thank you. Okay, that appears to have concluded our questions. Is there anything else, Lord Gill, that you want to add? The no, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Convener, for inviting me, and, and, and thank you for the um, the cordial uh, atmosphere in which this uh, uh, session has been conducted. I have sincerely tried to help the committee, and I hope that what I have said has been helpful. Um, and I, I would strongly urge you to refuse this petition. Thank you. I don't think we're going to make a decision on it this morning. I just ask agreement for the committee that if we drop a paper to be discussed at a future meeting so that we can collate all the, the information, the comments that Lord Gill and others have made and, and we can make a final decision at a, a future meeting. Do colleagues agree with that Aye. course of action? Okay. It just remains for me. Sorry, John. Yeah. Sorry, I <coughs> uh, indicate at a previous meeting that we would try and invite the new Lord President, when they were uh, appointed, uh, to give evidence, uh, formal evidence, to this committee. I'm not sure if the committee are still of a mind to wait on the appointment of the new Lord President and invite, because the new Lord President may have <coughs> a different opinion than the former Lord President in relation to giving evidence before this committee. I'm open to the, the, for the committee to uh, agree whether they want to do that. I wasn't party to the previous conversation, so I don't know what the members agreed in Zala, Angus and Jackson. Chair, I'm, I'm happy and feel that I'm in a position to make a decision, so I don't need any more meetings on this other than our own meeting. Angus? Well, I think given the um, situation we found ourselves in with the previous Lord uh, President, I think um, perhaps uh, some... some written evidence from, from the new Lord President would suffice, rather than asking him to appear, he or she to appear uh, at this committee again. Jackson. I think there's a distinction between the petition that we are considering and some of the more general issues that have arisen during our consideration of it. I actually think the evidence we've heard this morning is quite compelling in relation to the decision we will arrive at in relation to the petition itself. Um, what we might suggest <coughs> by way of any future examination of the broader issues, I think, is separate. And therefore, in order to arrive at a determination of the petition before us, um, I feel I myself now have the evidence that I would require in order to do that. I see most members of the committee nodding at that. So I think the suggestion that we bring a paper to a future meeting and, and we make a decision at that point, having collated all the information we've gathered up to this point, I don't see any desire from the members to seek any further information or to wait until we can get a response from the, the new Lord President. I don't think there's any demand for that, Angus. My comments were based on, on John Wilson's suggestion that we, we should seek uh, the new Lord President uh, ap appearing here, um, and I don't think that's helpful. I would agree with, I would concur with other colleagues that uh, I also have sufficient uh, knowledge now to, to, to make a, a balanced judgment. Okay, so we'll just bring a paper to a future meeting and we'll, we'll debate the, the information we've so far collated. Don't need anything else. Agreed. Okay. Well, once again, Lord Gill, thank you, and, and Mr. Flynn, thanks for joining us this morning, and we'll deliberate this at uh, a future meeting. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Thank you. and I thank the members of the committee too. <clears throat> I'll suspend the meeting for a few minutes. Do we change witnesses?